Hello everyone, it's very nice and exciting to be here. A lot of people, a lot of new faces, they didn't know that I was speaking, obviously, that's why they came. <laughs> so, uh, who here has heard of uh, Royal Raymond Wright? Who is familiar with his name? I would say just under half. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, okay, that's, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, it's, uh, I'm here tonight to bow my head to one of the greatest uh, science uh, geniuses of the last century. And I think uh, even though some of you or many of you have heard about him, it's worth reminding ourselves what an inspiring work he did, how, uh, how a great humanitarian he was, and how tragic his life. I think his achievement matches that of uh, Nikola Tesla, of course, in a different field in health and medicine and uh, microbiology. But um, of course, uh, he lost out. He lost out. That's uh, his story in a, in a nutshell. Royal Raymond Reif, we see the face of a kind and gentle man. At least that's what I see. He is here with his microscope. It's one of his uh, uh, legacies that he built microscopes. And a lot of people remember him as the person building microscopes. And that's, that is true. Let's look at his life in bullet points first. He was born in 1888 in Nebraska. He went to John Hopkins, but his interest took him into the field of uh, microbiology and bacteriology. So he didn't practice uh, much uh, medicine. He instead started researching cancer and uh, opened his clinic first in 1920 in San Diego, but then a proper one in uh, 1934. Yes, indeed, he built the world's most powerful microscope ever known to man. I will talk about that a little bit later. And uh, he isolated the cancer virus. I know it surprises a lot of people to hear that cancer is caused by viruses, but yes, that's what he found. He cured, initially, he, he, he performed with his followers and colleagues and fellow scientists, hundreds and hundreds of uh, tests and experiments, and they cured multiple people. But his first test, his first experiment on humans resulted in 16 of his first 16 cancer patients totally healed in three months. And those guys and ladies were like 30 kilos. They were just waiting to die, gray and frail. And he cured all 16 of them first in the first three months, and then 14 in the first three months, and then another two had to stay back another 20 days. And they all walked home free. He's had and his followers multiple treatments over the years. But of course, as you imagine, his method conflicted with orthodox views and he, won he was even arrested at one stage. His work, his research, his documents, everything he did, including his microscopes, were destroyed. And instead of earning fame and fortune, he died in 1971 in poverty and uh, destitution. Very interesting life story. He was uh, awarded an uh, honorary PhD from the University of Heidelberg in Germany, which is, by the way, the oldest university in Germany. It was established in 1386. Uh, he studied there, and uh, he also worked there, and also worked with Zeiss. That's a famous German company renowned for its optics and lenses and, and all that many of the uh, today's uh, mobile phones and the cameras are still equipped uh, with size uh, lenses. He developed a fascination with enlarging microorganisms and uh, that's uh, how it all started. He started research in San Diego and uh, developed a microscope and also what we call today and what they call in those days the beam ray machine. He received public support initially from a number of followers 
and fellow scientists who are very excited about his findings and, uh, and about his results, including Arthur Kendall and Dr. Milbank Johnson. And after these people saw his initial success with isolating disease-causing microorganisms and curing people by destroying those microorganisms, they organized a huge banquet, a big dinner in 1931, and they called that event the end of all diseases. Now it's dangerous. Now it's very dangerous. That's an original stock photo of that event. That's Royal Raymond Drive in the back. 44 scientists, important researchers, doctors attend the meeting and they were celebrating the end of all diseases. A great moment. But of course, as uh, his fame grew and more and more people found out about what he was doing, he uh, uh, got confronted by the AMA and in, and in particular, Maurice Fishbein, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. An article appeared in a San Diego newspaper, Evening Tribune, which announced that dread disease germs destroyed by rays, claim of San Diego scientists. So that's right with one of his early microscopes. Of course, uh, not everybody was happy with his discoveries. But to give you the background against which uh, he started his work in isolating viruses and microorganisms, we need to mention Pierre Antoine Deschamps in the, in the uh, late uh, 18th century, who used, he also used a microscope, and he saw microzemas, he called them microzemas, little unidentifiable microorganisms. But he was not the only one. Early 20th century, Günther Ederlein saw endobions, something inexplicable, something small in human tissues. Wilhelm Reich saw bions. All these different scientists were following their own path, looking for the meaning, I guess, of life and the cause of diseases. What Royal Raymond Reich did after all these people was that he used high resolution light microscopes. And that's the main difference. He could observe live organisms as they were moving around and invading human tissue. No one had done that previously. And the magic of this is that, of course, large magnifications can be achieved using electron microscopes, as we all know, but the electron ray destroys the microorganism. So whatever you see online, my, uh, electron magnetic uh, electron uh, microscope shots are all dead, dead uh, microorganisms, dead bodies, really. So he could observe live, active viruses and bacteria. Very interesting. That's what he uh, achieved and confirmed polymorphism, which uh, all these guys were uh, coming to uh, understand and discover. Polymorphism is something that uh, science more or less uh, has forgotten. Polymorphism means that many forms, many forms. You know, we believe and we went to school learning about viruses and bacteria, right? It's either a virus or a bacteria. Now, it is true in many cases, but it's not true in a lot of other cases because these microorganisms, as you will see in a few minutes, can change forms, shapes. They can take on virus-like properties and then mutate back into bacteria and vice versa. It's very interesting, fascinating. And his finding, of course, uh, confused the critics. Virus or bacteria? This is such a binary proposition. And it really upsets me sometimes when I think about oh, what a crazy binary world we live in. You are either a Democrat or a Republican. You are even a, you're either a liberal or a conservative, right? Ever since God separated light from earth, we've been living 
in this uh, binary world. Very interesting. I remember a famous uh, psychiatrist, uh, publicist, and a wonderful thinking person I admire very much back in my home country, Peter Popper, is writing is one of his books. I, am, I was born as a son of a rabbi. I was raised in a Catholic school. I received Catholic education. And I found my inner peace in Indian ashrams. Why can't I call myself, he asks, a Jewish, Catholic, Hinduist disciple? Isn't that right? So, yes, this binary proposition and the main architect of this distinction, this hard distinction between virus and bacterium was Thomas Rivers, who was a strong man at the Rockefeller Institute between 1922 and 1955. He pushed virology as a separate standalone science. And in 1926, he gave a very important speech in front of uh, major influential doctors and scientists in which he stated, and this is what we've been grown up with, virus needs a live organism to survive. Isn't that right? That's what we believe, that's what we were taught. It's true in many cases, but not always. And he also pushed virology as a separate science, separate field within microbiology, because this way he could push his own career. He was not a, quiet, a kind man. Uh, people who knew him uh, tell us that uh, he was a quarrelsome person with immense resources with the uh, Rockefeller Institute behind him. And he was just uh, a difficult person to deal with. He didn't take no for an answer. Risser, Arthur Kendall, who joined Reif in his work, uh, dared to challenge his binary theory, but of course he also lost the power behind uh, Thomas Rivers was too strong. Further background, also a guy called Peyton Roos in 1911 proved that virus can cause cancer. That was 111 years ago. He did receive the Nobel Prize for this, but he had to wait 55 years until he was 86. So not everything we take for granted is true. Yet another proof of pleomorphism. But of course, even today, the main reason of cancer is considered to be somatic mutation, right? Somatic mutation, some kind of a mutation in the body, a rapid acceleration of, of cell growth and stuff like that. Not many people dare to associate cancer in particular with microorganisms, but that's what Royal Raymond Reif did. But to put an end to this debate, whether it's virus or microorganism, mono, uh, um, um, uh, single form or, 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 or polyform, the 1971 National Cancer Act basically sealed the fate of this argument and stated that no more of this uh, poly pleomorphic uh, garbage, basically. So that was decided. Back to Royal Raymond Reif, he was fascinated by bacteriology, microscopes, and electronics. In World War I, he served in the US Navy, and somehow, it's not quite clear how, he visited a number of European labs and worked also with the US government. I guess he was just a very curious person. Arrives back in San Diego from New York, eager to research and investigate the electronic treatment of diseases. And he asked himself a question. What if I subjected small organisms to different electronic frequencies? I don't need to explain that uh, in, the, in this room that everything is frequency and vibration. But he was searching for an answer. What if I attack different microorganisms with uh, certain uh, frequencies? And that's what he started to do started to build microscopes because he wanted to see how those microorganisms behave. So his first microscope was uh, 17,000 magnification, but that was only his first one. And he also developed the beam ray machine, which he used to bombard 
these microorganisms with a certain uh, precise uh, frequency. And his major achievement was to determine each and every microorganism's MOR, or mortal oscillatory rate, or death frequency. The frequency of death. If you apply that frequency, that particular microorganism causing that particular disease just simply explodes, blows up, dies, and it's eliminated from the system. He explained it like all scientists can do this in a very simple way, like uh, when a singer blows up a wine glass when it resonates exactly the same frequency his uh, her voice as the uh, as the uh, wine glass. So he kept researching, kept researching, kept going and going, and he took all sorts of different diseases and put them under his microscope. He identified and cataloged the mortal oscillatory rate of over 24 microorganisms causing various diseases, including TB, anthrax, cholera, tetanus, B. coli, influenza, spinal meningitis, pneumonia, syphilis, gonorrhea, leprosy, streptococcus, conjunctivitis, bubonic plague, staphylococcus, diphtheria, typhoid, and various forms of cancer. He had the frequency of every single one of these diseases. Now, do you think it's a threat to the mainstream medical establishment? You're not kidding. It was. This is his first microscope that he built with a magnification of 17,000. In his days, I'm not sure about today, technology must have advanced a lot since then, but in his days, the maximum magnification you could get with a light microscope was two and a half thousand times. And he did, he achieved 17,000 using, I look, there's a long description and you can find the details on the internet if you really want to look uh, for it. But uh, he used double quartz prisms and powerful lights, which he patented actually. And this is his patent number. And observed live viruses and bacteria without staining and chemicals. So he could see in his own eye, with, with his own eyes, live viruses and uh, uh, other microorganisms. Fantastic. Can you imagine how exciting it was? Uh, fellow researchers working with him, uh, say, and had records, went, went on record saying that uh, sometimes he would stand, he would sit at his desk for 48 hours nonstop without taking any food or drinks, just looking into the microscope. 48 hours nonstop. He was a total, total nutcase. Very important. He could see both filterable and unfilterable forms of the oval motile bacillus typhosis. Filterable means that it passes through a small filter. The size of the microorganism is less than 0.3 micro. Unfilterable means usually bacteria that are bigger. They cannot pass through this filter, so they are called unfilterable. But the point is, they change forms. They mutate back and forth. Very interesting. By the way, has the COVID-19 virus been ever isolated? No. There you go. So what are we dealing with, really, other than uh, propaganda? Yeah. One copy, very interesting. One copy of his microscope, of the uh, biggest microscope, is uh, at London Science Museum, but it's not available for public viewing. Wonder why. Wonder why. It's not available for public viewing. Okay, so he was hunting for the cancer virus. He received multiple uh, cancer tissues and cultures from various hospitals and discovers a characteristic reddish purplish uh, granule in each and every cancer tissue. And he identified that as the filterable virus of carcinoma. That was in 1932. And this is becoming a little bit technical, but it's fascinating. He called this this uh, particular uh, filterable virus, BX. That's one fifteenth of a micron. And there is also a BY, which is bigger than BX. 
there was a monococcoid form, and that's that was in the blood of 90% of his cancer patients, and also something called Cryptomyces pleomorphia fungi, like in orchids and mushrooms. You can find this in orchids and mushrooms even today. So I know uh, I have, uh, where's my bag? Yes, here it is. I know it's a uh, it's, uh, suicide to uh, read out something in a public presentation, but I'm going to do that because it's quite, quite uh, fascinating. Reif wrote in his book in 1953, any of these forms can be changed back to BX within a period of 36 hours and will produce in the experimental animal a typical tumor with all the pathology of true neoplastic tissue from which we can again recover the BX microorganism. This complete process has been duplicated over 300 times with identical positive results. After one year, we take the same stock culture of dormant Cryptomyces pleomorphis fungi and plant it back on its original asparagus-based media. There is no longer Cryptomyces pleomorphia, no longer a monococcoid organism, such as is found in the monocytes of blood. There is no longer a BX or a BI form, but there is from the initial virus isolated directly from an unulcerated un human breast mass, a bacillus coli that will pass any laboratory method of analysis. So seemingly harmless bacterium, bacillus coli can be transformed into a cancer causing uh, virus. Would you like to hear him talk about this? Because I found their air recording on the internet. Let me just switch this, uh, let, let me just switch this uh, um, HDMI off and play this for you because it's quite fascinating. So as we isolate this organism, we have what we call the BX. It is a very complicated method and technique. The first material that we isolated was from an ulcerated breast mass that I received from the Paradise Valley Hospital in National City. We used and chose an unulcerated breast mass because we'd have less chance of outside contamination. I took those blocks about four millimeters square and I placed them in my K media. I incubated them. I had no results. I changed them at different temperatures. I had no results. I was running at that time possibly 400 transfers a day and determining the effect that the argon, neon, and krypton gas using as a bombardment in a loop would have upon the growth of pathogenic bacteria. We wanted to determine if it would stimulate or retard the growth. I was running those things through, as I say, four and five hundred transfers a day. And there was a vacant tube, a loop that was standing. And this one tube that I had with this uh, malignant tissue in was standing on the bench along there, and it might just as well have had a red flag on it. So I picked this thing up, and I dropped it in this argon loop. I left it for 24 hours till I was making my transfers the next day, and I looked at it. I saw that it had a cloudiness in it, which it did not have before. Well, I examined it immediately under the microscope, and I found nothing. And I chemically analyzed it, and I found out that it had been ionized by this bombardment of this 5,000 volts in this argon loop. So there's only one counteraction of ionization, that's oxidation. So I put it in a two-inch water bath, a two-inch vacuum and left it in the incubator for 24 hours. And I brought it out, and it had changed again. And I immediately put it under the microscope and began rotating my prisms, and I finally found it alive and teeming with one of the smallest of any of the filterable forms we had yet seen in a purplish-red refraction under the monochromatic light. They were less than a twentieth of a micron in dimension. Yeah, so, uh, of course, media started... Uh 
publishing stories a lot. He's, uh, that's him, his microscope, different uh, images uh, under the microscope. Local man bears wonders of germ life. So he found the virus, he identified the disease causing microorganisms. Now let's kill the virus. He started experimenting on animals, rats. What he did, he took this little BX, this little red dot, and introduced it to mice and rats. And within two to four weeks, they all developed cancer. And then he took his beam ray machine and started bombarding the tissue and the animal with this uh, radio frequency. And they all recovered over hundreds and hundreds of times. It was time to perform the first human experiment. It was 1934 in San Diego. Many more followed, not only San Diego, but in now other parts of the country, all the way up to New York. And uh, many diseases, these disease causing organisms, MOR, has been uh, recorded and uh, documented. In 1936, he opens a second clinic. Everything is looking up, everything is rosy. He's becoming famous. He's building a new frequency instrument and uh, several other several other diseases, not just cancer, were successfully cured. But that's when that's when things started to turn and uh, go downhill. His people, his followers, fellow researchers and scientists started to notice they are losing grants. They are not getting research support money. The International Cancer Research Institute refused to take on board Rife's studies and experiments and results, and they wanted to do their own tests. Former allies turned their back on Royal Raymond Rife. We know how it happens. The AMA threatens them with lawsuits, threatens them with uh, canceling their licenses and putting all sorts of pressures on these uh, people. So he started to feel lonely. This is his first beam ray machine. Sorry about the picture quality. Not many records and, uh, uh, and uh, memories have been preserved to this day. Enter. Uh, he built uh, the beam ray machine under the name of the beam ray company, but uh, it wasn't very successful because uh, Morris Fishbein wanted to buy in and wanted to get an exclusive right to the uh, uh, machine in 1939. But of course, his uh, approach was rejected by Wright, and he uh, he paid Philip Hoyland, that was Morris Fishbein, paid Philip Hoyland, who was Wright's 50% partner in the beam ray company, he paid Hoyland to sue Rife for exclusive ownership of the company on behalf of Fishbane. Rife had to go through this painful series of court cases and trials. He was a sensitive man, he was a nice man, he was not prepared to face the powerful and rich opposition. He started to turn to alcohol. He won the case, but by that stage, his company was penniless. He went bankrupt, and basically a lot of his research and work, and even the microscope was just uh, stolen and, uh, and just uh, disappeared. A few years later, he tried again to build beam ray machines, this time with a guy called John Crane. But shortly after that, a court case was brought against uh, the company again, for the manufacture and use and distribution of unlicensed medical instruments. You know what this uh, terminology is, of course. So they took uh, Crane, Rife, and another guy to court. Crane was, in fact, sentenced to 10 years jail. 10 years. Rife uh, uh, managed to escape. He retired temporarily in Mexico. and. Uh, a lot of people after this fiasco stopped using the beam ray machine purely for uh, 
existential reasons they didn't want to risk their livelihoods and their practice. Johnson, another ally of uh, Reif, who was working with him in San Diego in the lab, was poisoned in 1944. All the initial research committee records were destroyed. The microscope somehow vanished. And, uh, and, and a publisher of uh, a Smithsonian Institute report in 1941, praising the machine and the results that Reif produced, that guy was shot at, so he never touched the subject again. So that's how it works, fear and intimidation all around. Now, Morris Fishbank, I mentioned his name. Now, who is this Morris Fishbank? He was the secretary of the AMA and the editor-in-chief of, of the famous, or should I say infamous, JENA, that's the Journal of the American Medical Association, between 1924 and 1950. He was the son of a poor immigrant who uh, wanted to have power. And he felt doctors have power. So he went to medical school, but he only interned for six months. He never practiced medicine, but he found he could do a much greater good to mankind by, you know, uh, rubbing shoulders with the AMA and first joining the AMA journal as an assistant editor. Shortly after that, the editor-in-chief was sacked because of fraud. So he, he took his position. He became editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association. Now, I mentioned the face of life. I know facial features mean nothing, and you can call me crazy. But I mean, look at that face. <laughs> That's uh, Morris Fishbein, who didn't allow anything develop and grow unless he controlled it. His main works include Fads and Crockery and Healing, Modern Medical Charlatans. He was indicted with the AMA, actually, for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. The AMA was found fined. He was acquitted. But he is uh, interesting, a very interesting person. He managed to make it to the front page of Time magazine on, July, on June 21, 1937. So that's Morris Fishbein, who felt it was his, his, his calling to kill everything what we call today alternative. Of course, this whole term of alternative that's an interesting one. It comes from the Rockefellers, but we know how it works. He attacked homeopathy, osteopathy, chiropractic, and other quacks and uh, charlatans in the field. That's uh, Morris uh, Fishbein. And uh, of course, his appearance and his uh, repeated attacks on Rife and his work repeat, uh, led to his slow decline. By 1939, those doctors who attended the 1931 banquet denied ever knowing him or ever met him, ever meeting him. Strange and quite sad. Reif was penniless again. He had to sell his microscope in parts. Police, police ransacked his lab. All research papers were seized. Disappeared to a large extent, most of it. And in 1941, when a major breakthrough in cancer research was about to be announced, another lab working with the Rife method in New Jersey, the Burnett lab, was destroyed by a mysterious fire, literally the night before the announcement was supposed to be made. Rife defenders lost their jobs, lost their foundation grants, and Arthur Kendall, who was a long time ally of Reif from almost day one in San Diego, he was paid of $250,000 to retire in Mexico. That's what he did. So even Kendall turned his back on Reif. Cancer bodies, organizations, institutions still refused to test the beam ray machine. And John Crane's lab, remember, he was 
uh, Rife's partner in the second beam ray company. John Crane's lab also raided all equipment records taken. Arrest and death. Yes, Rife and associate Crane were arrested. No clinical records and evidence produced by Rife was allowed to be used in the court case. So he could not come up and support his business partner and fellow scientist. As a result, Crane, as I said, was sentenced 10 years in prison. Then, in order to escape from, uh, to escape arrest and the prison sentence, he uh, went to Mexico and he spent considerable amount of time in Mexico drinking and taking value. And the combination of these two is not the healthiest concoction, concoction you, can, you can say that. In 1980, the AMA was found guilty by a US Court of Appeal of conspiracy to restrain competition in new methods of healthcare. But by that stage, Rife was dead. His work just basically lost to the vast majority of the medical profession anyway. In 1971, he dies. In the same year, on the 31st of December, President Nixon signs a $1.6 billion law to open the war on cancer. The NCI's proposed, that's the National Cancer Institute's proposed budget for the year 2024 is 9.98 billion US dollars. I found a very interesting PDF on the internet. You can download it if you want, I can send you the link. It's a 116-page PDF that lists all the institutions around the world funding cancer research. And it's small typeface, like nine or 10-point characters, right? 116 pages. The number of cancer deaths in the US today, as we speak, is 1,670 per day. And if you look for uh, Royal Raymond Wright on Wikipedia, he was surprised to read this much about his life and work, and this much about health fraud after his death. That means people, yes, sometimes can artists, using his machine or copies or so-called copies of his machine to, keep, to cure people, perhaps even for financial benefit. Yes, I had a friend many, many years ago back in Hungary who used a rice machine. He built that rice machine. Apparently it worked so much so that he was basically smuggled into intensive care units, various hospitals in Budapest, and he was treating patients while the uh, doctors were turning their heads away in the late hours of the night. He usually went in 11, 12 o'clock midnight. He was working on these uh, ICU patients until uh, you know the morning shift started. It all had to be done in secrecy. So yes, some people used his fame, used his machine, used his idea to their own benefit. That's true. But I mean, isn't that strange? This much is written about his work in terms like he claimed to have found. He alleged that this. He so it's. Uh, um, it makes my stomach churn, really. And coming to the end of my little speech, I become very nervous when I hear the word science. Just after these last two, three years, particularly. And my question is, science, okay, follow the science, yeah, but who's science? Isn't it amazing that personal rivalries, mounting egos, money, um, or lack of it, power struggles, they determine the direction of science, not only in medicine, but also in archeology, span in history, in, 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 in medicine, in, in, in art, in every, 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 every other field. It's quite amazing. So be very skeptical uh, when you hear the word science. That's my advice and that's my conclusion anyway. If you want to find out more about life, be prepared for a wild ride, because this is more exciting than any 007 movie. The Cancer Cure That Worked was a book and still available on Amazon, written by Barry Lyons. 
but royalrife.com or biologicalmedicineinstitute.com, Royal Raymond Rife, or royalrifemachine.com have a lot of information still available about his work, about his legacy. And fortunately, not everyone has forgotten what he did. Some people are still out there looking, searching, even selling Rife machines. Of course, I cannot warn if they work or not. That's for each and every one of us to check and investigate. I have to say thank you very much. And uh, I don't know the answers, but uh, if you want questions, <laughs> please ask them. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Victor. No big hand for Victor. Okay, so let's go to questions. Um, so again, the question. Um, I've never heard of him before. So thank you very much for this talk because I, it, but it opened up a door in my brain because I'm glad, I'm glad. I know <laughs> about Dr. Hulda Clark and Dr. Hulda Clark was um, born in, born in like the 20s and she, uh, you, you know about her, right? Yes, I, I, I have so many, so many brave people over the last 100, 150 years. Do, do you know if they ever met or you ever read anything of, because she uses what they, she calls her zapper, and it's all yes, about the frequency true, yeah. to kill the organism. And I've known about her for, uh, since I was probably died, like 25 years ago, I discovered all of that. And I just read something in the, in the internet somewhere about them now discovering that inside of cancer tumors, there's fungus. That was in like mainstream news. So you don't know, and you've never read <laughs> no, anything I'll about the truth I, I, I don't know, and I have never read her name in conjunction with uh, with Wright. But very, very interesting talk. Thank you. And I Thank you. I'm going to do some more research. Yeah, please now. do that. Just just Google Ray Ray Wright. Yeah. A whole fantastic world will open up. Questions? Great. On one slide, uh, you referenced that, I think it was 1980, the AMA lost some court case that yes. said that they were throttling innovation. You know, you maybe don't know the answer to this, but that, in that court case, did they actually reference uh, Raymond Wright and his innovation? Yes. They did. Yes. 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 But of course, this was not the only crime the AMA committed. I mean, we could go. Anyway, that's a long list. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Tom. I had a very similar question to the, to the last one. Thank you. Um, but the, the slide before you had mentioned that uh, um, Morris Fishbein had been indicted by the AMA. Well, I guess yes. that was a lot earlier. I don't think you gave us a date. No, no, no. It was around uh, uh, in the early days. It was in the, in, in, in the 30s, early 40s. Yeah, so early 40s, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. And, and even at that time, we were seeing uh, pushback against the AMA. Uh, that's kind of pleasing to, to hear. Well, Reif still lost the war, so yeah. But, yeah. Oh. Good talk, Vic. Thanks. Now, that story, you could interchange the name for a number of Oh, of course, people, exactly. Right? Did, you, exactly. did you go down to Nikolai Tesla? Story? Did you sort of go into that in, as a parallel? Or not, not on this, not on this occasion. But I, I see these two guys as equals. Sure, it's identical. I, I think I, how, how they're sort of economically and yeah, um, yeah that's right. Yeah. Credibility-wise, sabotage, and then just run out of. Just, uh, just, just, just remind, remember what I said. He identified twenty-four diseases. He could cure. Right. Can you imagine how we would all look if? Uh, if yeah, you succeeded. No, that leads me to my next question or next part of did you did you go down the rabbit hole of brain theory versus the germ theory? Because it, you sort of touched on it without going past the point of virology versus germology. I, I did many years ago, not okay. in preparation for tonight's talk. Okay. Many years ago I was heavily involved with marketing and distributing Chinese herbal based products and natural products right. and all that. So we were intensively researching all sorts of quote unquote alternative methods, treatments, potions, products, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. This is how we were fascinated and still are with some of the stories that have right. come out over the last, I would say, hundred years, really. Right. 
uh, you know, just to finish off that point, you could probably just replace virology or viruses with the word parasite, and you'd probably have the you'd be more accurately identifying the root cause of cancer and and yeah. Those. But the whole point in polymorphism is that there's no such thing as viruses or bacteria. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a much more colorful. It's it's right. it's, it's, it's shades of gray, right? right? And, and they I, can interchange from 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 a. Uh, from rods to balls, from balls to spirals, and all that growing size and shrinking size and all that right. and can show different pro properties and characteristics. It's unbelievable. Right. Right. But of course, modern medical science doesn't recognize No, it's that. a bipolar world. If it's a bipolar know. world. It's, it's a binary yeah. world, yes. <laughs> well done. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Anthony. Yep. Yeah. On a similar vein, I've also seen many such claims. Yeah. And even recently, pit talks with people are claiming they're using frequencies and sounds and plasma, and you see videos and they're very believable. But it seems we never get to the point where there's a controlled study to actually test any of these technologies and they don't seem to lead anywhere. So I'm not too sure what we're meant to do with this information. As much as it's fascinating and hopefully true and makes logical sense, and I can understand all the suppression, but it, it never progresses to the point where any controlled study is made and then any technology can be used in a practical sense. So even for people with cancer, I don't, I don't know what they can do to use this technology or where we go from this. Well, there's not much they can do because Rice machine doesn't really exist in its original form, unfortunately. I think what I was trying to achieve here tonight is to encourage all of you to do your own research and uh, find your own answers because I don't believe we live in a black and white world. And some methods work for some people, may not work for others. That's even with vitamins and minerals and food or drugs, medications. Not, not everything works equally with everyone. I think we all have to experiment and listen to our inner voice and say, is this working for me? Yes, great, I'll continue on that path. If not, just look for something else. Great, any other questions? Um, I don't recall the name, but earlier on, um, somebody who was like an associate of Rockefeller tried to buy the machine, or the rights to the machine. Um, um, I guess I'm asking you to speculate, but is the assumption that they would have bought it and then just own the rights and then just buried it and not use it? Is that, in a, is that what you would speculate? Or do you think they intended to actually cure people? I think it would have been, personally, I believe it would have been too obvious to buy the rights and sell it under the name of the AMA. I think that, that doesn't work like that. Buying it and burying it, it's a much more likely scenario, yes. And that's why probably Rife refused the approach from Maurice Fishbein. Okay. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Did you happen to by chance get into the working mechanism of the machine a bit? Can you like do you know a little bit about it or because I'm wondering, the name, for the name, stepping from the name, I'm assuming it's a, it's a ray, um, some sort of laser ray. Or... There are lengthy descriptions, even today, on this particular website. Uh, this one. That's uh, quite a detailed description of uh, the microscope and the beam ray machine as well. But try these three resources. But to be honest, I'm not a scientist. I don't want to compete with life. Yeah. I'm a communicator, I guess. I, no, I, think brought, I brought the news here tonight, but uh, I'm not an expert. Okay. Okay. Uh, in terms of protocol or how he used it? Some, uh, the book also has a lot of information. Yeah. You can buy it for like $14 or something on Amazon. And these resources, just Google. Google and uh, or pre uh, uh pre search call like pre search pre search pre search I, I started using pre search yeah okay any any no more questions hey oh yep oh, sorry 
Rachel. I just have a comment more than a question, but like six hours ago, I was reading from a book that I grabbed off of these shelves, and it talks about electricity as being a primary cause of cancer. I can't remember the name of the book, Rainbow, Invisible Rainbow. And it also talks about the fact that the same um, type of frequency that's being discussed here can also cure that. So then the polymorphic piece comes in. It's like, okay, nobody has really defined what any of this is. And it is, um, it just saddens me that we are in a place where with so much information, everybody has to have a yes or no answer, a black and white answer to what causes could be, what outcomes could be. Um, and, I, and I don't know where we got there, but um, again, there's a ton of stuff that all leads in the same direction with the frequency. Well, you can make a lot of money researching the subject and, and research cancer, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Guys, any more questions? There's one in the back, yeah? Or maybe you were just stretching. Oh, oh no, it's good. Yeah. Someone was just um, st stretching, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not drowning, stretching. So, um, sorry, guys. So now that we've had the question, so let me ask how many people in this room have ever used a frequency machine? Okay, great. Quite a lot. Does anyone want to talk about Anyone want to talk about some of the experiences they've had and what kind of machine it was? Pablo, for example, you want to go first? <laughs> All right. Hello? Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay. First evening, we're already taking the stage. Um, hi. So, yeah, I, I use uh, a machine called Dini. Maybe some of you have heard of it. I don't know. Healy. Healy, yeah. H -E -A -L -Y. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm aware, I know that a lot of the frequency programs in that machine are based on Rife's um, discovery, discoveries that have been developed from by, by, by other researchers. The way it works, you get electrodes stick to your body. You might have seen these tent machines that people use to exercise and get muscle. It's, it's a different thing, but it's kind of related. You have a, a frequency generator. Uh, which gives microcurrent. Um, and the idea is that different frequencies, um, there are two dimensions of how it actually works or how it actually benefits your health. Um, on the basic dimension, just the microcurrent frequency is supposed to increase the cell membrane potential and give vitality to the cell, which in turn increases ATP production and uh, protein synthesis and uh, cell communication and whatnot. And then Overlaid on that, there is the dimension of the frequency itself that can trigger something, apparently, like similar to what uh, Rife's um, rays must have done to create resonance and then basically pop, pop the microorganisms. Um, in the same way, you can think about cell receptors having a resonant frequency, which interacts with a um, neurotransmitter, for example. It's, it's like this catalyzator principle same same idea behind that i don't really, i don't really know how it works but um from my experience these machines they if you use them daily they increase your vibration if you want to call it like that they give you more vitality and help your body take care of the stuff by itself so feed in and charge the batteries i don't know how to say it in other words um and then every once in a while i had a program that really did something instantly in pain management for example there are certain frequencies that i know of that are related to pain management. Um, you can stimulate certain nerves. So basically every structure in our body uh, obviously has a different size. And since we have a bioelectric reality, every, every structure in the body can be like an antenna or like a receiving or sending antenna as well. So that's why different, different wavelengths have different effects in the body. So long, long story short, yeah. So that's, that's my experience that I had. I'm using this device for three years and I'm pretty I'm pretty thrilled of it. It's like a biohacking thing, but it's typically it's it's used for pain money. I don't know. Maybe maybe somebody has other machines. Wait, wait, get rid of this, this is sold through network marketing, so you can get it uh, from, from people who do social selling. Um I've got a I've got a friend who's very big into that. 
<laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I've never done the business side of it. Like I've never pursued it very much, but I'm intrinsically very interested about all these topics. Um, I have another machine called Time Wave of Frequency, which is like a, a therapeutic device where I can actually write programs using Rife's uh, frequency list. So the stuff is out there uh, and it, it's being worked on. So there's a lot. So if you're interested, hit me up. I can I can explain more about it. That's basically it. Um, there is not only machine in frequency. For example, this is a source of frequency. And if you don't put something to protect this, you got a bad frequency in your brain every time you put this on your head. So I got something here, I don't know if you got, but most of us, we don't have uh, protection of, uh, of the telephone. And eventually, if I can make a test with you, uh, a, a muscle test, without the telephone is uh, strong, if I put the telephone, it is weak. So the frequency is everywhere. But there is, um, for example, uh, I used to work in America 10 years ago in a company where they use stone or even product. And let's say in America, uh, Blueprint infuse, you say this in English, blueprint infuse, infuse. They infuse the frequency in something. It can be a stone, it can be a product for the skin, it can be something external, internal. But if you if you have this stone with you, it protects your biofield. And the biofield, this is what I want to say, the biofield is every human body got a field of frequency to protect us. And um, the vegetal, the trees, they got a biofield. The earth, the planet, got a biofield. And now, with all the attack we, we are um, affording, affording, yeah, the biofield, our biofield can be destroyed a little bit everywhere. So we got now uh, instrument to measure how it can be destroyed. And the question is, if we repair the biofield, can we heal ourselves? And the answer is yes. So there is another dimension. We don't we don't have always um, the necessity to use a machine. We can use the frequency in something else, keep it with us, and eventually restore our biofilm, our protection um, against all the bad vibration because it's called EMF, electric uh, frequency. And as you know, maybe everybody here, we are surrounded by EMF everywhere. So this is a real danger. So frequency is a real subject, not only in healing uh, on the cellular level, but also with our body to, 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 to be in good health in a natural way. Is it there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The EMF can be attended with the IMF. Okay, so um, later on we can talk more about this if anyone has anything to say. Um, possibly you're talking about organite is, is one of these things. Organite, if you're familiar with it, organite is a mixture of um, these substances that supposedly not get rid of the EMS that come in from computer and energy everywhere, but they break them down and they scatter the frequency into less harmful ones. Um, so what uh, like Didier is talking about You've probably seen them before. People have these little, they look like little stickers you stick on the back of your phone or your computer. They had them around Japan like over 20 years ago. And like most of my friends had them. And supposedly they play the same role as organite and they break down the dangerous frequencies and they scatter them and they make them less harmful. Okay. Yep. Sorry, if I take the mic again. Organite. 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 Yeah, we should have the organite in our place, like a little pyramid sometimes. Yeah. You put in the place and you protect the place because we have Wi Fi. We just have, we have this, but we have the Wi Fi, and Wi Fi can kill the, the plants, can affect the animals. So we, we need to protect this. And there is something else called Shangit. That's why I take the mic. Yeah. The Shangit is a stone that absorbs. All the bad frequency, but many many stones absorb like turquoise. The turquoise uh, absorb radioactivity, and it change the color. If you take a turquoise here, it's blue. If you take a turquoise one hundred years after, it's green. 
because it takes the radioactivity from your body and your body. That's why in the ancient uh, tradition in Tibet or in Mexico, everywhere, always wearing turquoise to protect from the radioactivity. Great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have two things. I, first, I want to elaborate on organize. Um, when you when you want to buy an organize, my friend Donna makes them, and she makes organized individual beads and things, and I make jewelry out of them so that you can wear your organize. She makes them to stick on your phone, and but she is very specific. We went on a buying trip to Bangkok, and she bought Shanghai. And she was looking for a particular kind of shungite because the shungite's really important. You can buy organites online or something. If you don't know who's making them, they have to have like five different kinds of metal inside. And then there's crushed, crushed quartz crystal, which which amplifies you know everything that's going on in there. And then they're in a bake of resin, which is neutral. And you can have them like a coaster to put under your drink, or you can put them in your refrigerator, like people used to do in pyramids. And and they are really quite accessible. There's bunch of people on the island that make them and they're pretty as well because you can wear them with jewelry and stuff like that and and i i find that i i can she has a she's a meter and she, you take your phone and measure the phone and then you put the organite on the phone and then you measure it again and the meter goes and goes right down so it, it she has proven to herself at least you know and she believes in it that it works it's a very nice experiment <laughs> The other thing I just wanted to talk about is I used to use my zapper. I had a Dr. Hulda Clark zapper. I started on a journey of cleansing and seven day cleansing fast. And I was using betonite, psyllium and, and colonics. And, and I still do, I still do all that stuff. I don't do it as much as I used to. And, but the zapper was something that was recommended in the program that I learned to do. And I really want to buy like an updated version of it. And what they have is different programs that you can, cards, programs that you can put into it that will work on different parasites. And she, Dr. Hulano Clark is big on parasites because, you know, I have a lot of animals. I've always had animals. And I'm sure, sure, that somewhere along the line, I'm getting in contact, living in the tropics, having animals with parasites. So I use, uh, in English, it's, in French, it's vermifuge. In English, it's like a, like worm, worm medicine. Twice a year, I worm the whole house, the animals. I worm everybody. You know, they have different ones you can buy here. You don't need a prescription for them. You just worm yourself. Yeah, ivermectin works. Um, there's the one called Zentel. So, well, I used to get my listen. I I gave my horse every five weeks. My horses got ivermectin because they were exposed to parasites eating the grass and and all that kind of stuff. It was a regular thing. It never hurt any of them. You know, it was dose, it was dose by kilo. You know, you're not going to give yourself the same dose of ivermectin you're going to give a horse. But the I, I'm going, I really want to buy another zapper because I found an enormous amount of help using the zapper. When I would use it, I would attach it to my wrist and I would lay down and it would run its little three, it was three series. It would run one series, there would be a few minutes off, it would run, and it was automatic. And I would, I would sleep better, I would feel better, I would feel calmer, and of course I wasn't getting sick. So I do recommend, and that's why I really want to do some research on Dr. Hulda Clark and Wright comparing their thing. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, fantastic, everyone has a story. So again, guys, a big hand for Victor and his wonderful, fantastic, amazing, informative talk. Thank you, Victor. Okay, so if any questions, feel free to turn up Victor now. Make your crowd around Victor, ask him. And uh, Robbie's going to put on some rocky music, and we're going to the social life. Thank you very much.